I'm live. I actually wasn't late, even though I thought I would be. That's pretty good. Oh, that's what I was going to do before I started the stream. Whoops. Never mind. Never mind. As long as you guys can hear me. It's not interfering with the microphone. It should be plugged in. It is. Um... Yeah, it seems to be going okay. Yep, it's picking that up. Hello. Hello, gentle viewer. Whom so are you be? Awesome. I said I was going to be late because I thought I was, but I wasn't. I rescued my mascara from that tube. I cut the tube open, kind of. So it's been a busy day. Let's see. We've got the last chapter from oh, from Frankenstein's point of view, Victor's point of view. And then there's just a little wrapping up dialogue. It thinks I, it thinks I bookmarked chapter 19 for some reason. Twenty twenty-two. Twenty-two? No, nope, because we've done that. Hey, how's it going? I thought I was gonna be late, but I wasn't. Um I'm trying to find the right chapter. It's bookmarked it in the wrong place. Yeah. I wonder if the um the tragic unfolding of Victor's wedding was completely surprising to people reading at the time or if we are supposed to think that he's a dipshit for not seeing that coming. I mean, I'm sure there are scholarly articles that can tell me that, but I don't want to read stuff. Okay, I found the right chapter, but I need to get to the right beginning of it. I have a sinus headache. Yep, chapter 24. Yes, yes, my sister messaged me. So, um, the uh, the clinic has cunningly come up with a bunch of reasons for not opening on a Friday that are not COVID related. So it wouldn't have to automatically reopen when level one starts. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. All I know is that I carry a lot of anger within me. Much like Victor Frankenstein or his 14-year-old creation. Yes, yeah. They're full of excuses. But you know what? I got back my mascara from that tube. What more could a person ask for? Uh, the recap's going to be interesting, I think. <laughs> it's ash blonde. It's not grey. Hey, Danny. Yes, there is a... <sighs> it's a carnival of bullshit. I mean... Yeah. Because I used to love watching Tuck's Wonder Dogs. Do you remember Tuck's Wonder Dogs? And they'd make them do the like obstacle courses and stuff. But now I'm the dog jumping through all the hoops, except it's to get life-saving medicine. And the hoops are like, and, and I hate it. The Wonder Dogs used to love it. But I hate it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I might. I don't know. Um, 
see how we go because we have the last um hello hello oh i'll tell you those reasons but anyway this isn't like a vlog or anything this is frankenstein so we should probably stick to the subject two subjects today actually firstly this is ash blonde it is not gray but I'm not like super happy coming up to my birthday because it's really hard to think that like I'm not young and I haven't been young for a while and I don't get to be young again. So like all the shit that I did when I was young, that's kind of done and I don't get to have another go at it. Which is in some ways comforting because I had a lot of hangovers back then. But, you know, it's just kind of an existential um, situation. But I'm going to get a birthday cake iced like a Ninja Turtle like I had when I was three. So I probably won't, but I'll, I'll think about it. So yeah, that's my Philip. That's my word thinking for today. And the recap. Oh, we got to do the recap. We don't start till 10 minutes in. <sighs> and it's nearly that. Okay. Victor destroyed the creature's bride before he brought it to life. Um, the creature got pissed off, said, I'll be with you on your wedding night. Uh, Victor's wedding night comes around. He thinks, oh no, the creature's going to kill me. Ah, oh, fuck. Sorry, I got allergies today. Um, he thinks the creature's going to kill me. So he, you know, gets a gun, sends Elizabeth into the other room. And lo and behold, the creature kills Elizabeth. Because it is tit for tat with ladies at the moment. And uh, Victor is just completely gobsmacked and unable to understand it. Excuse me. So I don't know if we're meant to <laughs> if we're meant to think that Victor is a self-absorbed dummy or if it was just that shocking at the time. So um he was very, very angry. Uh the creature has run away. Victor's gone to the magistrate saying, I don't think you're going to believe me, but here's my life story. And presumably at that point, if you want, you can go back to the first video and listen to all of them again up to that point. And then you'll be ready to continue. Uh, and the magistrate's like, look, I believe you, but I'm not. I'll put a few guys onto it, but it's a really weird story. I don't think we're going to catch him. Like you said, you made him eight feet tall and really strong. But at least they don't suspect Victor of the murder because, you know. Because <sighs> his dad's rich. He has a castle. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to think of myself as an adult. Um, like a proper adult. Um, I can think of myself as a young adult, I suppose. Like the young adults of the young ones. But... Yeah, it's very difficult. I think, like, from my perspective, the hardest part about being an immortal Highlander is knowing when it's time to stop claiming that you are the Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanoff. Because at some point it just becomes implausible. Like, the dates don't add up. So, who's to say? So that was the recap. You will be young then anyway, Evelyn. Um, so, so Victor's just had a big patty at the... Um, where does the word patty f come from? Like as a synonym for tantrum. 
I hope it's not like an Irish thing. Hmm. Well, he threw a patty anyway, whether it's racist or not. Nationalist? Ugh. <sighs> Just babbling now. Um. So, yeah. This is the last Victor chapter of Frankenstein, chapter 24. He's just run out of the house like the Naruto run, which I know about from memes. Run out, like, really mad. So my present situation was one in which all voluntary thought was swallowed up and lost. I was hurried away by fury. Revenge alone endowed me with strength and composure. It moulded my feelings and allowed me to be calculating and calm at periods when otherwise delirium or death would have been my portion. My first resolution was to quit Geneva forever. My country, which, when I was happy and beloved, was dear to me, now in my adversity became hateful. I provided myself with a sum of money, together with a few jewels which had belonged to my mother, and departed. Does your dad know you took that shit? Wait, did he die? I can't remember. And now my wanderings began, which are to but which are to cease but with life. I have traversed a vast, vast portion of the earth and have endured all the hardships which travellers in deserts and barbarous countries are wont to meet. How I have lived, I hardly know. Many times have I stretched my failing limbs upon the sandy plain and prayed for death. But revenge kept me alive. I dared not die and leave my adversary in being. He's so, like, apologize for the sniffling. When I quitted Geneva, my first labor was to gain some clue by which I might trace the steps of my fiendish enemy. But my plan was unsettled, and I wandered many hours round the confines of the town, uncertain what path I should pursue. As night approached, I found myself at the entrance of the cemetery, where William, Elizabeth, and my father reposed. Oh, okay, so if if the dad didn't die, then he's dead now, because they buried him. Big Heathcliff energy. Yeah, um, I think Heathcliff is a lot more uh, focused than Victor. You know, Victor changes his mind all the time and isn't quite sure what he wants to do or why. But they are both very, very dramatic. I entered it and approached the tomb which marked their graves. Everything was silent except the leaves of the trees, which were gently agitated by the wind. The night was nearly dark, and the scene would have been solemn and affecting, even to an uninterested observer. The spirits of the departed seemed to flit around, and to cast a shadow which was felt, but not seen, around the head of the mourner. <laughs> He's got his better in stats. That's, yeah, that's true. Normal intelligence and the emotional kind. The deep grief which the scene had at first excited quickly gave way to rage and despair. They were dead, and I lived. Their murderer also lived, and to destroy him I must drag out my weary existence. I knelt on the grass and kissed the earth, and with quivering lips exclaimed, By the sacred earth on which I kneel, by the shades that wander near me, by the deep and eternal grief that I feel, I swear, and by thee, O night, and the spirits that preside over thee, to pursue the demon who caused this misery, until he or I shall perish in mortal conflict. For this purpose I will preserve my life. To execute this dear revenge will I again behold the sun and tread the green herbage of earth, which otherwise should vanish from my eyes for ever. And I call on you, spirits of the dead, and on you, wandering ministers of vengeance, to aid and conduct me in my work. Let the cursed and hellish monster drink deep of agony. Let him feel the despair that now torments me. And since he said he kissed the earth, I'm picturing Victor doing all of this with, like, mud. Pretty much like that. Looking like he has a little beard. 
I had my go I had begun my adjuration with solemnity and an awe, which almost assured me that the shades of my murdered friends heard and approved my devotion. But the furies possessed me as I concluded, and rage choked my utterance. I was answered through the stillness of the night by a loud and fiendish laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's me he can hear me laughing at him it rang on my ears long and heavily the mountains re-echoed it and I felt as if all hell surrounded me with mockery and laughter surely in that moment I should have been possessed by frenzy and have destroyed my miserable existence but that my vow was heard and that I was reserved for vengeance the laughter died away when a well-known and abhorred voice apparently close to my ear addressed me in an audible whisper. Good choice by the creature to make it audible. I am satisfied, miserable wretch. You have determined to live, and I am satisfied. Ew, it's a cemetery. Have some respect. Yeah, he's already miserable. He's been miserable. You... Oh, yes, all right. Come on, then. Good girl. Good girl. Nyby has learned to... Yes, that's your name. She's learned to meow outside so I can open the door. So I can know that she's there. Is this cat a genius? Or am I just used to cats who are complete morons? I think it's a bit of both. Hey, sweetie. There are no more treats down there. She got them all. Um, I darted towards the spot from which the sound proceeded, but the devil eluded my grasp. Suddenly, the broad disk of the moon arose and shone full upon his ghastly and distorted shape as he fled with more than mortal speed. Did Victor make him faster? Why? <laughs> she is a cat prodigy. She's so heavy. <sighs> I pursued him, and for many months this has been my task. Guided by a slight clue, I followed the windings of the Rhone, but vainly. The blue Mediterranean appeared, and by a strange chance I saw the fiend enter by night and hide himself in a vessel bound for the Black Sea. I took my passage in the same ship, but he escaped. I know not how. You're, you're a very inconspicuous lad. Always, you know, screaming about revenge and your murdered friends and those wandering ministers of vengeance. Why, oh, why did I give him rocket legs? I made my creature eight foot tall with rocket legs. <sighs> but hindsight, hindsight's twenty twenty. Also, I gave my creature twenty twenty sight. Yeah. I gave him so much. <laughs> uh, amidst the wilds of Tartary in Russia, although he still evaded me, I have ever followed in his track. Sometimes the peasants, scared by this horrid apparition, inform me of his path. Sometimes he himself, who feared that if I lost all trace of him I should despair and die, left some mark to guide me. The snows descended on my head, and I saw this print of his huge step on the white plain. To you first entering on life, to whom care is new and agony unknown, how can you understand what I have felt and still feel? Cold, want, and fatigue were the least pains which I was destined to endure. I was cursed by some devil and carried about with me my eternal hell. Yet still a spirit of good followed and directed my steps, and when I most murmured would suddenly extricate me from seemingly insurmountable difficulties. Sometimes when nature, overcome by hunger, sank under the exhaustion, a repast was prepared for me in the desert that restored and inspirited me. The fare was indeed coarse, such as the peasants of the country ate, but I will not doubt that it was set there by the spirits that I had invoked to aid me. Often, when all was dry, the heavens cloudless, and I was parched by thirst, a slight cloud would bedim the sky, shed the few drops that revived me, and vanish. Well, that's nice. That's something, isn't it? I followed when I could the courses of the rivers, 
but the demon generally avoided these, as it was here that the population of the country chiefly collected. In other places, human beings were seldom seen, and I generally subsisted on the wild animals that crossed my path. I had money with me and gained the friendship of the villagers by distributing it, or I brought with me some food that I had killed, which, after taking a small part, I always presented to those who had provided me with fire and utensils for cooking. That's... <sighs> that is a very good point, Danny. Yeah. The creature does want to keep him alive. I also gave him psychokinetic abilities that make him able to summon rain. Not sure why I did that. I just wanted to know if I could. But we never stopped to ask ourselves if we should. Yeah, it's the creature. It has to be. Wow. My life as it passed thus was indeed hateful to me. And it was during sleep alone that I could taste joy. Oh, blessed sleep. Often, when most miserable, I sank to repose. And my dreams lulled me even to rapture. The spirits that guarded me had provided these moments or rather hours of happiness, that I might retain strength to fulfill my pilgrimage. Deprived of this respite, I should have sunk under my hardships. During the day, I was sustained and inspirited by the hope of night, for in sleep I saw my friends, my wife, and my beloved country. Again, I saw the benevolent countenance of my father, heard the silver tones of my Elizabeth's voice, and beheld Clerval enjoying health and youth. I've heard that sometimes when guys are close, they'll enjoy their health and youth together. Um, it's just something I heard, though. Um, depends, because I think the creature's motives for it are to keep Victor alive to be miserable. Does it matter what the motives are? Interesting question. Uh, often, when wearied by a toilsome march, I persuaded myself that I was dreaming until night should come, and that I should then enjoy reality in the arms of my dearest friends. What agonizing fondness did I feel for them? How did I cling to their dear forms, as sometimes they haunted even my waking hours, and persuade myself that they still lived? At such moments, vengeance that burned within me died in my heart, and I pursued my path towards the destruction of the demon more as a task enjoined by heaven, as the mechanical impulse of some power of which I was unconscious, than as the ardent desire of my soul. Yeah, probably. I have all these great ideas for, like, stuff, but then I don't want to do anything. It makes me tired, and then I get bored. I could never be a detective. I've been watching like Columbo and Poirot and stuff. I could not be a detective. Because you have to think about the same thing for like a day. Like a whole day at least. No thank you. What his feelings were whom I pursued I cannot know. Sometimes indeed he left marks in writing on the barks of the trees or cut in stone that guided me and instigated my fury. My reign is not yet over. These words were legible in one of the inscriptions. You live and my power is complete. Follow me. I seek the everlasting ices of the north, where you will feel the misery of cold and frost, to which I am impassive. You will find near this place, if you follow not too tardily, a dead hare. You were right, Danny. Eat and be refreshed. Come on, my enemy. We have yet to wrestle for our lives. But many hard and miserable hours must you endure until that period shall arrive. You were right, Danny. It is the creature leaving food for him. Smarty. That's a really long message to carve on a tree. Uh, I don't think she minds, but yeah, my wife... He just thinks it sounds more important than my cousin. Which is what she also was. Scoffing devil. Again do I vow vengeance. Again do I devote thee, miserable fiend, to torture and death. Never will I give up my search until he or I perish. 
And then with what ecstasy shall I join my Elizabeth and my departed friends, who even now prepare for me the reward of my tedious toil and horrible pilgrimage? I don't think you're going to heaven, Victor. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, they were much closer than a normal husband and wife because they were all that other stuff too. And who's to say what normal is apart from, you know, everything. As I still pursued my journey to the northward, the snows thickened and the cold increased in a degree almost too severe to support. The peasants were shut up in their hovels and only a few of the most hardy ventured forth to seize the animals whom starvation had forced from their hiding places to seek for prey. Do you want to come up here, darling? Said Victor. Do you want to come up here? Come on. Nibby, come on. The cats are full. Go buy more dental treats. Hmm? Hmm? Ooh. <laughs> Oops. Gentle. Gentle. There. Now. I should have moved the um, camera actually, but just little crumbs, eh? Come on. Jump right up. Ah, I want you guys to be able to see her. Never mind. Doesn't matter. Um, do, 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 do. The rivers were covered with ice and no fish could be procured, and thus I was cut off from my chief article of maintenance. The triumph of my enemy increased with the difficulty of my labours. One inscription that he left was in these words. Nibi, shh, stop it. <sighs> She's scratching. Uh, one inscription that he left was in these words. Prepare, your toils only begin. Wrap yourself in furs and provide food, for we shall soon enter upon a journey where your sufferings will satisfy my everlasting hatred. A shorter message, but still quite a long one to carve on a tree. I'm impressed with the creature. Yeah, I also gave him scissor hands, not sure why. Yes, oh my god bloody creature see even if you love them and take care of them they'll start scratching up your couch that you paid four dollars for by the way it's four dollars i won't see again she's eating now my courage and perseverance were invigorated by these scoffing words i resolved not to fail in my purpose and calling on heaven to support me, I continued with unabated fervour to traverse immense deserts until the ocean appeared at a distance and formed the utmost boundary of the horizon. How unlike it was to the blue seasons of the south. Covered with ice, it was only to be distinguished from land by its superior wildness and ruggedness. The Greeks wept for joy when they beheld the Mediterranean from the hills of Asia and hailed with rapture the boundary of their toils. I did not weep, but I knelt down and with a full heart thanked my guiding spirit for conducting me in safety to the place where I hoped, notwithstanding my adversary's jibe, to meet and grapple with him. Don't grapple with the creature, Victor. Come on. Some weeks before this period, oh dear. It's fine. Some weeks before this period, I had procured a sledge and dogs, and thus <laughs> they they still write sled as like sledge. Some weeks before this period, I had procured a sledge and dogs, and thus traversed the snows with inconceivable speed. I know not whether the fiend possessed the same advantages, but I found that, as before I had daily lost ground in the pursuit, I now gained on him. 
so much so that when I first saw the ocean, he was but one day's journey in advance, and I hoped to intercept him before he should reach the beach. With new courage, therefore, I pressed on, and in two days arrived at a wretched hamlet on the seashore. I inquired of the inhabitants concerning the fiend, and gained accurate information. A gigantic monster, they said, had arrived the night before, armed with a gun and many pistols, putting to flight the inhabitants of a solitary cottage through fear of his terrific appearance. He had carried off their store of winter food, and placing it in a sledge, to draw which he had seized on a numerous drove of trained dogs, he had harnessed them, and the same night, to the joy of the horror-struck villagers, had pursued his journey across the sea in a direction that led to no land, and they conjectured that he must speedily be destroyed by the breaking of the ice, or frozen by the eternal frost. Yeah, I mean, how did he know he was only one day behind the creature? How could you know that? Unless he talked to these peasants. This is before he made it to the... I don't know. <laughs> um, on hearing this information, I suffered a temporary access of despair. Do they mean to write excess? Doesn't matter. Excess of despair is really Victor's thing. He had escaped me. And I must commence a destructive and almost endless journey across the mountainous ices of the ocean. Amidst cold that few of the inhabitants could long endure and which I should live and be triumphant, my rage and vengeance returned, and like a mighty tide I overwhelmed every other feeling. After a slight repose, during which the spirits of the dead hovered round and instigated me to toil and revenge, I prepared for my journey. Yes, even though the creature leaves him a message saying, hey, I left a dead hare for you a little bit back. That's for you, eat it. And keep chasing me. He's like, oh yeah, well the creature did it too. But mostly it was probably an angel. I exchanged my land sled for one fashion for the inequalities of the frozen ocean. And purchasing a plentiful stock of provisions, I departed from land. I cannot guess how many days have passed since then. But I have endured misery which is nothing but the eternal sentiment of a just retribution burning within my heart could have enabled me to support. Immense and rugged mountains of ice often barred up my passage, and I often heard the thunder of the ground sea, which threatened my destruction. But again the frost came and made the paths of the sea secure. By the quantity of provision which I had consumed, I should guess that I had passed three weeks in this journey, and the continual protraction of hope, returning back upon the heart, often wrung bitter drops of despondency and grief from my eyes. Despair had indeed almost secured her prey, and I should soon have sunk beneath this misery. Once, after the poor animals that conveyed me had with incredible toil gained the summit of a sloping ice mountain, and one, sinking under his fatigue, went to live on a wonderful farm, I viewed the expanse before me with anguish, when suddenly my eye caught a dark speck upon the dusty plain. Dusky plain? Makes more sense. I strained my sight to discover what it could be and uttered a wild cry of ecstasy when I distinguished a sledge in the distorted proportions of a well-known form within. Oh, with what a burning gush did hope revisit my heart. Warm tears filled my eyes, which I hastily wiped away that they might not intercept the view I had of the demon but still my sight was dimmed by the burning drops, until, giving way to the emotions that oppressed me, I wept aloud. Yeah, the dog went to live on a wonderful farm, where the creature's bride also lives. She takes really good care of it. But this was not the time for delay. I disencumbered the dogs of their absent companion, gave them a plentiful portion of food, and after an hour's rest, which was absolutely necessary, and yet which was bitterly irksome to me, I continued my route. The sled was still visible, nor did I again lose sight of it except the moments when, for a short time, some ice rock concealed it with its intervening crags. I indeed perceptibly gained on it, 
And when, after nearly two days' journey, I beheld my enemy at no more than a mile distant, my heart bounded within me. What the fuck are you going to do when you catch up, Victor? He is still very strong. You made him that way. We're all thinking it. I don't need to say it. But now, when I appeared almost within grasp of my foe, my hopes were suddenly extinguished, and I lost all trace of him more utterly than I had ever done before. A ground sea was heard. The thunder of its progress, as the waters rolled and swelled beneath me, became every moment more ominous and terrific. I pressed on, but in vain. The wind arose, the sea roared, and, as with the mighty shock of an earthquake, it split and cracked with a tremendous and overwhelming sound. The work was soon finished. In a few minutes, a tumultuous sea rolled between me and my enemy, and I was left drifting on a scattered piece of ice that was continually lessening and thus preparing for me a hideous death. I'll never let go, Frankenstein. I'll never let go. Yeah. The, you're right, Evelyn. The creature has created a situation in which his horrible father will be happy to see him. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, in this manner, many appalling hours passed. Several of my dogs went to that same wonderful farm, and I myself was about to sink under the accumulation of distress when I saw your vessel riding at anchor and holding forth to me hopes of succour and life. I had no conception that vessels ever came so far north and was astounded at the sight. I quickly destroyed part of my sled to construct oars, and by these means was enabled, with infinite fatigue, to move my ice raft in the direction of your ship. I had determined, if you were going southwards, still to trust myself to the mercy of the seas rather than abandon my purpose. Idiot. I hoped to induce you to grant me a boat with which I could pursue my enemy, but your direction was northwards. You took me on board when my vigour was exhausted, and I should soon have sunk under my multiplied hardships into a death which I still dread, for my task is unfulfilled. Oh, when will my guiding spirit, in conducting me to the demon, allow me the rest I so much desire? Or must I die, and he yet live? If I do, swear to me, Walton, that he shall not escape, that you will seek him and satisfy my vengeance in his death. And do I dare to ask of you to undertake my pilgrimage, to endure the hardships that I have undergone? No, I am not so selfish. Yet when I am dead, if he should appear, if the ministers of vengeance should conduct him to you, swear that he shall not live. Swear that he shall not triumph over my accumulated woes and survive to add to the list of his dark crimes. He is eloquent and persuasive, and once his words had even power over my heart, but trust him not. His soul is as hellish as his form, full of treachery and fiend-like malice. Hear him not. Call on the names of William, Justine, Clerval, Elizabeth, my father, whatever his name was, and of the wretched Victor, and thrust your sword into his heart. I will hover near and direct the steel aright. This is the end of Frankenstein's story. So... It begins with him describing the boat captain's like, hey, what were you doing out there in the Arctic? And Victor's story begins with how his parents met and ends with him promising to be a ghost and to hang out with you. So that's, that kind of covers everything, I think. Comprehensive. And now we're going back to the ship's captain, Captain Walton. I think it's Robert, I'm not sure. August 26th, 17 dash. Yeah. He has a lot of guns. Intense physical strength. And he can live in conditions that would kill human beings. So. What you have to do is you have to set up a trap with a big ham. And say, you have won a ham, creature. And then a big butterfly net just falls on him. 
I don't know how you get the ham back out again, though. I don't want to waste a whole ham. August 26, 17 dash. You have read this strange and terrific story, Margaret, and do you not feel your blood congeal with horror like that which even now curdles mine? Sometimes, seized with sudden agony, he could not continue his tale. At others, his voice broken yet piercing, uttered with difficulty the words so replete with anguish. His fine and lovely eyes were now lighted up with indignation, now subdued to downcast sorrow and quenched in infinite wretchedness. Sometimes he commanded his countenance and tones and related the most horrible incidents with a tranquil voice, suppressing every mark of agitation. Then, like a volcano bursting forth, his face would suddenly change to an expression of the wildest rage as he shrieked out imprecations on his persecutor. His tale is connected and told with an appearance of the simplest truth, Yet I own to you that the letters of Felix and Safi, which he showed me, and the apparition of the monster seen from our ship, brought to me a greater conviction of the truth of his narrative than his asseverations, however earnest and connected. Such a monster has, then, really existence. I cannot doubt it, yet I am lost in surprise and admiration. Sometimes I endeavoured to gain from Frankenstein the particulars of his creature's formation, but on this point he was impenetrable. Are you mad, my friend, said he, <laughs> or whither does your senseless curiosity lead you? Would you also create for yourself and the world a demoniacal enemy? Peace, peace, learn my miseries and do not cease to increase your own. Frankenstein discovered that I had made notes concerning his history. He asked to see them, and then he himself corrected and augmented them in many places, but principally into giving the life and spirit to the conversations he held with his enemy. Since you have preserved my narration, said he, I would not that a mutilated one should go down in posterity. Thus has a week passed away while I have listened to the strangest tale that ever imagination formed. It took a week. Thank you for rescuing me from the ice flow in the Antarctic in the Arctic Circle. You're welcome. How'd you get there? Well, set aside a week for my story. Uh, well, I've listened to the strangest tale that ever imagination formed. My thoughts and every feeling of my soul have been drunk up by the interest for my guest, which this tale and his own elevated and gentle manners have created. I wish to soothe him, yet... Can I counsel one so infinitely miserable, so destitute of every hope of consolation, to live? Oh no, the only joy that he can now know will be when he composes his shattered spirit to peace and death. Cheery. Yet he enjoys one comfort, the offspring of solitude and delirium. He believes that when in dreams he holds converse with his friends, and derives from that communion consolation for his miseries, or excitements to his vengeance, that they are not the creations of his fancy, but the beings themselves who visit him from the regions of a remote world. This faith gives a solemnity to his reveries that would render them to me almost as imposing and interesting as truth. <sighs> oh my gosh, I've just seen one of the cutest things in my life. Hang on. I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to make sure you all can see it. But i got to pretend that I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to put this in the Frankenstein thread. Um, okay. I'm getting a little breathless. It's just allergies or dust or something, but yeah. Um, our conversations are not always confined to his own history and misfortunes. On every point of general literature, he displays unbounded knowledge and a quick and piercing apprehension. His eloquence is forcible and touching. Nor can I hear him when he relates a pathetic incident or endeavours to move the passions of pity or love without tears. 
What a glorious creature must he have been in the days of his prosperity, when he is thus noble and godlike in ruin. He seems to feel his own worth and the greatness of his fall. I love writing to my sister about a dude that I found who is super, super hot. I love that. So good. When younger, said he, I believed myself destined for some great enterprise. Gift a child. My feelings are profound, but I possessed a coolness of judgment that fitted me for illustrious achievements. This sentiment of judgment the sentiment of the worth of my nature supported me when others would have been oppressed, for I deemed it criminal to throw away in useless grief those talents that might be useful to my fellow creatures. When I reflected on the work I had completed, no lesser one than the creation of a sensitive and rational animal, I could not rank myself with the herd of common projectors. But this thought, which supported me in the commencement of my career, now serves only to plunge me lower in the dust. All my speculations and hopes are as nothing, and like the archangel who ins aspired to omnipotence, I am chained in an eternal hell. Oh, he means the angel Raphael. Yeah, God made him a, um, a sort of bipedal martial arts turtle uh, in return for being sassed one day. My imagination was vivid, yet my powers of analysis and application were intense. By the union of these qualities, I conceived the idea and executed the creation of a man. Even now, I cannot recollect without passion my reveries while the work was incomplete. I trod heaven in my thoughts, now exulting in my powers, now burning with the idea of their effects. From my infancy, I was imbued with high hopes and a lofty ambition, but how I am sunk... Oh, my friend, if you had known me as I once was, you would not recognize me in this state of degradation. Despondency rarely visited my heart. A high destiny seemed to bear me on until I fell, never, never again to rise. And now we're back at Walton. Must I then lose this admirable being? I have longed for a friend. I have sought one who would sympathize with and love me. Behold, on these desert seas I have found such a one, but I fear I have gained him only to know his value and lose him. I would reconcile him to life, but he repulses the idea. <sighs> I thank you, Walton, he said, for your kind intentions towards so miserable a wretch. But when you speak of new ties and fresh affections... Think you that any can replace those who are gone? Can any man be to me as Clerval was? Or any woman another Elizabeth? Even where the affections are not strongly moved by any superior excellence, the companions of our childhood always possess a certain power over our minds which hardly any later friend can obtain. They know our infantine dispositions, which, however they may be afterwards modified, are never eradicated and they can judge of our actions with more certain conclusions as to the integrity of our motives. A sister or a brother can never, unless indeed such symptoms have been shown early, suspect the other of, fault, of fraud or false dealing, when another friend, however strongly he may be attached, may, in spite of himself, be contemplated with suspicion. Oh, he has terrible luck with men especially the one he created. He was all like, ah, uh, I want a woman friend. Frankenstein was like, oh, damn it. Um, but I enjoyed friends. Dear, not through habit and association, but from their own merits. And wherever I am, the soothing voice of my Elizabeth and the conversation of Clerval will be ever whispered in my ear. They are dead, and but one feeling in such a solitude can persuade me to pres preserve my life. If I were engaged in any high undertaking or design, fraught with extensive utility in my fellow creatures, then could I live to fulfill it. But such is not my destiny. I must pursue and destroy the being to whom I gave existence. 
then my lot on earth will be fulfilled and I may die. That's the end of that letter. Let me see how much we've got left. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got lots left, don't worry. Um, uh, uh, right. Oh, yeah, the captain's got terrible luck with men as well, just because, you know, the first guy he found that he's super attracted to, his answer to a simple question is to tell you a story that takes a week. And ends with him saying that, you know, his ex was just so great that he he really can't be with you. He's always thinking about Henry Clavel. But yeah, I would say we have one more one more video in us and then it will be the next thing. <sighs> Which is very exciting. And I'm going to post a picture in the Frankenstein thread of what I was looking at before and you, you guys are going to like it. So, <sighs> thank you for being here tonight. Um, thanks for hanging out with me. And be safe, look after each other, wash your hands. I'm an angel, I mustn't be vexed. And I'm a doctor, pretty much. So yeah, thanks for being here. See you, not tomorrow, but the next day. Yeah, I know, I'm Raphael. <laughs> Cast out of heaven into a sewer. <laughs> So dumb. Okay. Bye, everyone. See you not tomorrow, but the day after. Bye.